but to speak to me through whatever means possible, whatever means he may provide through songs, podcasts, verses, prayers, someone he puts in my path, multiple people throughout the day, etc. And he's done this to me over and over again. And uh, this particular message came, or this passage came to me when I was a point in my life when I was down. And uh, when I say down, I'll explain. I'm not talk, I'm t- what I'm talking about is the ebbs and flow of life. You know what I'm talking about. My mood, my emotions, attitude, or in this particular case, at this point, uh, it was my time and interaction with God. And by that, I don't believe that, I don't mean that my belief in God had waned by any means. That's not the case. Or that I believe that God left me. I know that's not true. Uh, but I, I mean my end of my relationship with God. You know what I'm talking about? As in everything, our lives, they seem to continually be heading up, up to a peak. We're either on the peak, we're coming down the slope toward the valley, or we're in the valley, or we're headed back up again, and so on and so forth. And at this point, I was low, I mean down in this valley. And I was home, and I happened to be wa- watching a movie called, the, you may have seen it, The Free State of Jones. It's a Civil War era movie starring Matthew McConaughey. And at a certain scene in this movie, a boy had, been, had gone to war with, with him and had been killed, and he was back home. He had taken the boy and took him back home, left the army. And uh, he, was, he was at the gravesite and he was doing the funeral. And I knew, I knew this was scripture. And I knew he was holding the Bible from the scene. And I could tell by the way the words were it was scripture. But I didn't know what they were. And I don't know if I'd ever heard them before in my life. And as the movie played and I heard them, I paused it. I rewound it. I paused it rewound it again and listened over and over. After about a half a dozen times, I got out my phone and got on Google and took the verses and typed them in and researched and found what it was. And I went and got my Bible and I went over it and back and forth and over it, read over it. And there's no doubt in my mind that in that moment, God knew that I needed those verses and he knew I needed to hear them right then through that movie. <laughs> uh, And I know it because that's how God and I have it. You heard me say this happens over and over and over again in my life. And that's how our relationship is. And I'm reading these verses and I well up and I start smiling. I'm crying and carrying on. And I read them over and over again, as I said. And the next thing you know, I'm coming out of that valley right then. I'm headed on my way back up toward that peak. Amen. And I mean, I was moving fast too. And you see, these verses brought me to realize again that God is always there with us. No matter where we are with him, he is there with us. So I pray to God that these verses will provide this same result and comfort to you here today and and listening online. So Psalm 139, beginning in verse 8 through 16. If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there thy hand shall lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, Even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret, and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. Please bow your heads with me and pray. Dear Father God, we love you, Lord. We thank you for allowing us this time to gather back in your house today. Lord, I thank you so very much for that time in my life, for bringing these words to me, Lord. And I pray that uh, you use them now to, to help someone else here listening today. Lord, I just pray that right now you... You hide me behind the cross, Lord, and uh, Lord, just project yourself. I pray that you feel this. Pray that we've done our job, Lord, and prayed ourselves up and prepared ourselves for worship today. Lord, I pray that you fill us now with the Holy Spirit, Lord, and affect us the only way, only the way that you can. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Our lives are full of up and di- ups and downs in our personal lives, our jobs, our relationships, and our walk with God is not exempt from this. I mean, there are times we may ask, what is going on with me? Or God, where are you in this? Or maybe just even God, where are you? 
And it's in these times we need to remember something about God and about ourselves. God does not change. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, God says, For I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. In Numbers chapter 23, verse 19, Balaam states in an oracle, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of humankind that he should change his mind. Has he said, and will he not do it? Has he spoken, and he will not fulfill it? See, we are the ones who change. We are the ones who ebb and flow in all areas of our lives, but God never changes. And more importantly, as David states, God is always with us. The further truth of the matter is that you can't get away from God no matter how hard you try. As he is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent, all-powerful, all-knowing, and everywhere at all times. Look with me starting at verse 8. If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. Now this one ought to be pretty easy for us. If we could get to heaven right now, God would be there. And I think we all know that, right? And there is no part of heaven that he is not present. As one commentary that I read puts it, I could not find myself where God is not. Then, if I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. Now, if you have a King James Version, it says hell. If you have a NIV, it'll say the depths. And about most other versions, it'll say Sheol. And, and to be clear, I do believe there's an existent difference between hell and Sheol. But for the context David is using here, I believe he means the opposite of heaven, which we know to be hell. Uh, so if I make my bed in hell, and think about this, brothers and sisters, don't we all make our bed in hell from one time to another at some point in our lives? I mean, without the saving grace of God and the atoning blood of Jesus Christ, our beds would be in hell right now, wouldn't they? But even in hell, behold, thou art there, God. Imagine being in hell, trying to hide from God, coming around the corner, and bam, there's God right there in front of you. Behold thou, behold God. That's the context that David's using there. There he is. Verse 9, if I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, let's say I could fly across the earth as fast that I could outfly the first rays of the morning light, those first rays at dawn, if I could fly that fast to outrun them, and then go far to the horizon, to the extreme west where the sun sets, where the sky and the, sea, and the sea meet. Even there thy hand shall lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. Even in that far away distant place, I find God's guiding hand, and his right hand, in which we know to be a reference of someone's strong hand. The right hand is a strong hand in the context of the Bible. God's strong hand holds me up and leads me. In Acts chapter 17, the end of verse 27 and beginning of verse 28, he is not far from each of us, for in him we live and move and exist. Brothers and sisters, how comforting are these words, knowing that whatever direction, however far we may go, to do whatever we may find ourselves involved in, God is always there. Every single one of us under the power, protection, and authority of God. He is always holding us up and leading us. We only need to recognize it and follow his guidance. In the next two verses, my resources explain two courses of thought that may be taken from them. Verse 11, if I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. So basically, if I try to escape from God by plunging into darkness so that it provides some sort of screen over the top of me, I'm trying to get so far into darkness that it replaces every bit of light. I'm camouflaged by the dark from God. Well, in this context, we're, tri we're clearly trying to hide from God. And why would we want to do that? Well, we're trying to hide our sin from God, right? The other context is a situation of peril or danger that may separate someone from God. That you're in a situation beyond your control that separated you from God. Brothers and sisters, that's impossible as well. Know that no matter how we try to hide or how far we get from others, to the point that no one else on this earth may see us or know that we're at, God is still there. Now this can be both frightening and comforting. Frightening for the lost to know that on judgment day there will be no place to hide from God. Comforting for the believer to know that we are never alone. Amen. When all others may turn from us, He is there. When the world seems dark and closing in around us, we are always at the forefront of God's mind. And verse 12 tells us, Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee. But the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. Daniel chapter 2 verse 22 says, He reveals the deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and light dwells with him. 
You see, light and dark are real to us, but they're no different to God. Where we can see plainly in the day, but left only to feel our way around in pure darkness, it's all the same to God. He created it all. And the magnificent light of God penetrates a darkness or gloom far worse than we can ever imagine and radiates far brighter than we can ever imagine the sun being. As God created the sun, his presence certainly multiplies the sun's brilliance magnificently more. The point here is that for believers who think they're hiding in their sin, oh, you may keep it a secret from others, but not from God. For the lost who think they're too far gone, beyond salvation, that God doesn't want them, we've just read nothing, and no one is beyond God. How many of us have been like old Jonah and tried to run away from God, only to be brought back even more so into his presence? In Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 23 and 24, the Lord declares, Am I a God who is only near, and not a God who is far away? Can man hide himself in secret places where I cannot see him? Do I not feel the heavens and the earth? No matter our individual circumstances, we are the ones who place perceived limits on the power of God. That for which these verses have just explained is impossible. No matter where you are, no matter the situation, lay your troubles on God and trust that he will see you through. Arthur Don Lesson once stated, God loves us where we are, but he loves us too much to leave us there. Mm. No one is beyond God's reach. His steady hand is on us because he loves us. He sent Jesus himself in human form as a sacrifice to atone for our sins. Praise God from who, all, from our, from who our salvation and all blessings flow. Then pick him back up in verse 13. For thou hast possessed my reins. Here David is saying, God, you know me and see me always because you are the one who made me. Basically, I am yours, God. The pulpit commentary that my great uncle Lawrence gave me further explains that David is saying, Thy om omniscience and thy omnipresence both rest upon thy om omnipotence. God's ultimate knowledge of all things, coupled with his being everywhere, are due to his all being all powerful. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb, meaning God has woven me in my mother's womb. In Job chapter 10, verse 11, Job says, You clothed me with sin and uh, you've clothed me with skin and flesh, and wove me together with bones and tendons. Now, I'm going to pause here for just a moment and head down a little side road uh, for just a second. One thing, we can all agree that we're living in a time where the value of human life is in turmoil. At every turn, we hear of some kind of abuse or murder or slavery, sex trafficking. And these atrocities are not new to the world, as we can read stories of them right here in our Bibles. We may hear more about it today because of instant news and social media, but these sins are not new. And of these I've just mentioned, at least I can say with a good percentage of certainty that we all here have the same opinion of these sins that I've listed. But there is one subject that I dare to say that invokes differences of opinion in every crowd that you will encounter, possibly even within this gathering here. The subject of abortion has many arguments that surround it, being right or wrong, who weighs in on the right or not to, at what point is a pregnancy, at what point in a pregnancy is it okay, at what point should it be too late? Even when considering the point of actually being considered a life or a person. I certainly have my opinions on all of these, but I'm not here to argue these with you today. That said, I'm simply, I simply ask you to consider one argument within this seemingly complex subject. At what point is a being a being? At what point is someone a person? This topic is now argued as much as any other revolving around the subject of abortion. And all I ask that you do is consider these verses when forming your own opinion. Just some personal consideration. We just heard David say in verse 13, God knows each of us and always sees us because he made each of us. This makes us his. Now in verse 14, I will praise thee. The miracle of our individual creation and mere survival to the point and through birth is enough to warrant praise and adoration of God. There's a reason that we have heard it called the miracle of birth. As most any doctor would agree that the ability and process of what it takes for beings to reproduce and the act of birth itself is truly miraculous. Eve knew birth was a miracle from God. In Genesis chapter 4 verse 1, Eve says, I have, I have had a male child with the Lord's help. Eve knew that Abel's birth was more than a result of her and Adam's love. 
In Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 5, just as you don't know the path of the wind or how bones develop in the womb of a pregnant woman, so you don't know the work of God who makes everything. We don't know it, nor do we understand it, because it's a miracle of God. The simple definition of a miracle is a surprising and welcome event that is not explained or understood by natural or scientific laws and is therefore considered to be the work of a divine agency. Next, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. The human body, if we knew enough of everything it took, everything in our bodies, it took of everything in our bodies to operate, the intaking, the producing, the pumping, the flowing of blood, sensing, firing off, or moving, ridding itself of, realization, thought, and so on and so forth, it would scare us to death if we knew everything that was going on. One comment that I read said, if we could just see one half of what is going on within us, we should dare not to move. The exactness of our bodies, if we truly knew it, we'd be scared to throw that off, fearful. God's creation of our bodies is truly wonderful and amazing. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. Here David is saying, God, all that you do is marvelous. And even though I realize that I may not be able to comprehend the extent of your marvelousness, at least I do know the fact that all you do is marvelous. David is saying, that, Lord, I do know. And I know it right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret. Substance refers to an embryo in the womb. Made in secret refers to the mysteries of conception that still remain, withstanding all the today's modern science. And curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth holds the same explanation as verse 13 in that God made us. The Amplified Bible says, intricately and, and skillfully formed as if embroidered with many colors. This is in reference to the various tissues within the human body or of the human body. Then again, in the lowest parts of the earth, it brings us back to being made in secret by God within the concealment of our mother's wounds. Again, God made us, meaning we are his. And lastly, in verse 16, thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. David is here again with my substance or my embryo, but this time he adds being imperfect or still unformed or unfinished. The Hebrew text has one single word in place here. And I apologize, but I did not learn this word to read this word at Woodlawn Elementary School. <laughs> I'm not saying they didn't try to teach it. I just said I didn't learn it. Let me be clear on that from my teachers back home. But I have learned what that word means, and that is the still unformed embryonic mass. So at this point, we backed up a little farther in that now we see God knew us before he even finished creating us, even back in the first makings of an embryo. See, this means you were God's before you were even a you. Then further in verse 16, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. All my days were known to God from the first to the last before the moment I began to exist. God knew each one of us before we were born, and he knew the moment we were conceived. Just as he's known every mo moment up to this very one, and he knows all that remain until he calls each of us home. Now that we've read through these verses, I'll circle back to the earlier sidebar question. At what point is a being a being? Google defines a being as the nature or essence of a person, the state of having an existence, the state of participating in reality. Well, the timing of conception or being a, becoming a being, a person, a life may be a mystery to us, but it's certainly no mystery to God. You exist in the mind of our holy God before anything else. And you are a child of God in his reality, not a perception or an opinion of what reality is, but the one true and pure reality that exists before anyone else knew you existed. If that doesn't answer the question, there are no answers. Now back to my main point. We've just read that God was with you even before you were even finished. Actually, before you even began to start. And this being the case, how can you think he's still not with you now? We all have struggles. We all have problems. We have all strayed or stepped away or gotten sideways of God in some way. But he has never turned his back on us. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But thank God, Romans chapter 3 doesn't end right there. We are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ, whom God put forward as appropriation by his blood to be received by faith. 
This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who is faith in Jesus. All born since the fall of Adam have sinned. I've sinned. You've sinned. The sweetest person you know on this earth has sinned. But God has paid the price to release us of this bondage of sin through the blood of Jesus Christ. He didn't do this because he is indifferent to sin. God hates sin. He did this because he, because he loves you and me. And he wants a relationship with us. And he wants us to be with him forever. He gives us free will because he wants us to make that choice. God didn't want to make robots that he could just force to do. He could just do whatever he wants them to do. He wants us to love him. He wants us to choose him. And these verses tell us that he has a plan for each and every one of us. We might not know what the plans are, and that bothers us because we want to be in control of our lives, right? But we just need to trust God to guide us. He doesn't tell us it's going to be easy. But even in our problems, we should be asking God, how can I glorify you in this? How can I be obedient in this situation? The comfort comes from knowing that you're not alone. Remember, his strong right hand is on us, and he's leading us. You need to just follow the guidance of God. Allow him to lead you. Use the discernment and wisdom that he has given you to assist you along the way. And when the moment comes to make a decision and make a stand for God, do it. Give him all the glory he deserves for all that he does in you and through you. I may not know what I'm going to do tomorrow, but I know the God who does know what I'm going to do. And he'll do it in such a way that I couldn't have begun to fathom it to begin with. This isn't just my opinion. I can testify of his guidance and use of me in my life. Brother Long, we talked about that earlier, that we don't hear enough, enough testifying today. And I want, but I'm going to do that right now. And I just want to clarify something before I begin, though. There's nothing special about me. You just ask Kathy, she'll tell you that. <laughs> All kidding aside, there's nothing special about me in the context of what I have to do with it. What is special about me is that I'm a child of God. Amen. I know it. I'm not ashamed to tell everybody about it. And I just follow where God leads me, and he places me in positions or circumstances where he can make a difference through me. And I try to make much of him whenever he does it. Some of you may know some, some of these, and I'll try to be brief about these. Um, there was a time back in late 2018 that uh, I felt the Lord really tugging and really pulling on me about ministry. About, so I didn't know exactly what, and I called Brother David, and I was like, hey, I need to meet. I need to talk. I've got to figure this out. He's just, he just pulling. I'm, I'm not doing something. I'm not doing enough. He's leading me. I need, I need to be doing more. So we started talking about the ministry, and as some of y'all know this. And so we went back and forth, and he was really guiding. Him and Brother Will actually were guiding me through this time in my life, and Kathy. And we, our whole family was sitting down. We talked about it often. And we were going, and at first we were like, look, Lord's calling us away. We're, we're, we're going into the ministry. And I was prepared. I'd called HR. I was prepared for 23 and a half years with the city just to put it on the side, and we were going to go. And the Lord was, was really on me. And it kept going back and forth, but it just, it just wasn't where we'd take that step. Something was still holding us back. And time came along, and in the in early part of 2019, Brother David offered me a job, a position within this church, part-time, I was associate pastor of missions, and, uh, and I was fired up about it. Those of you know, I've, I'm passionate about missions. I haven't been able to go as much in the last few years, but I love mission work, and I was fired up. I mean, Kathy will tell you, there's many times I've come home from there, and I said, if I could get them over, I wouldn't come home. I just, I just love the work we're able to do over there. But anyway, he offered me that job, and I said, this is it. And we just kept, we go, went back and forth and went back and forth, but when it was all said and done, it, something just wasn't right. It just wasn't time to go. And so I called Brother David. It was on April 1st, 2019. I called him. I said, Brother, I, we, we've, we've got, I think we've got it figured out. I need to talk to you. He was like, all right. He said, Friday, we're going to meet for breakfast at Paul and Jackie's, 7 o'clock in the morning. You know, we're Baptists. Every time we meet, we've got to eat. So, <laughs> so we were going to meet at Paul and Jackie's. April 1st, we set that meeting up. We was going to meet on the 5th of April. Knew, knew, had our minds made up. Mayor Joe Pitts walked in and asked me to meet in my office on April 4th at about noon. And he asked me to be interim general manager at Clarksville Gas and Water. And uh, 
I told her, I said, I'll, I'll do whatever you need me to do right now. I'll go home. I'm going to talk to my family about it, see what they say, and I'll give you an answer either tonight or in the morning. So went home. We talked about it. That was it. That We knew, we knew all right, this is, this is what it is. This is what the Lord's calling us to do. And here, this is why. He confirmed in us that less than 24 hours before I had to tell this brother. And I walk into Paul and Jackie's, and I sit down with Brother Dave, and I said, we've got our mind made up. I told him what happened. I said, Brother, the one thing I don't understand, I, I don't know what – What's going on is this. He said, what's that? I said, I don't know what this means for, for my ministry, what the, where the Lord's leading me in my life. He said, oh, son, don't worry about that. He said, every pulpit ain't in the church. That run all over me. I will never forget that day in those words as long as I live. I remember during that time when the mayor asked, or he, we, we went to tell uh, the folks at Gas and Water. Right back then we had about, between 250, about 280 employees. And uh, we had five different meetings to get them all in there at one time. And I was able to stand up in front of those employees. And the first words out of my mouth were, this does not happen without God. And I said, this, this, this past, people don't choose this for themselves. And I didn't go into the whole story I just told you. But it was, uh, it was awesome to stand up there and testify what God had done in my life in that moment. And one group even stood and clapped about it. They've <laughs> and God has shown up time and time again. Uh, some of y'all remember a time back, remember then in Clarksville, we, not too long ago, we had a huge water leak. 30-inch line had come apart. It was horrible. We were calling uh, places out in the industrial park. We were asking customers to, to uh, reduce their use. We had called factories and asked them, please slow down. Please do whatever you can do. If not, we're going to run out of water. And I won't get into all the details, but through, through our fantastic staff and the work of the community and everybody pulling together, we never lost one customer. But the key to the thing is, by every, every instrument that we had, everything at the water plant on water tanks, everything that we had said we should have ran out of water. Everything. There is no calculation, nothing that can be done. Dusty, you can testify to this. We should have ran out of water on the north side of town. But the reason we didn't is God. God, there is no way that happens. That God pulled all that together with the employees, with the staff. He provided that water because everything, it should have happened hours before we ever got that water turned back on. And then when the time came and the mayor asked, well, will you get up in front of the council and, uh, and tell them what happened? I said, I'll be glad to. But just know this, when it's all said and done, I've got a list of people that I want to thank at the end of it. And he just grinned. He knew. And he said, okay. And I got the opportunity to stand in front of that city council, stand up in front of my city and tell them again and glorify God first and foremost to how he blessed all of us. He needs to know that. And there's much more, there's many more intimate times that the Lord God has orchestrated other events uh, through employees and things like all through where God led me. And again, it's not nothing about me. It's about him. But, but singular employees, one came in, he was struggling with some mental health issues and we were going, I just sit down and talk to him for like an hour. We just sit down and talk through it, ex explain some situations we had been through, I had been through, and uh, really talked him through. We got done. He said, Mark, I, I appreciate this. Man, you don't know. He said, I, I wouldn't have ever expected this. I said, let me explain something to you. These budgets and these council meetings and all this, anybody can, there's others that can do this a whole lot better for me. But let me explain something to you. The reason I'm here, God put me here, and he put me here for times like this so I could sit down here and pray with you. He put me here to show, to show employees that we love them and that he loves them. That's why, that's why I'm here. Another time, one of our employees in a call center was diagnosed with cancer a while back and uh, had the procedure and some treatments scheduled and all that, and there was a, a small group wanted to, wanted to gather around her and have prayer in the call center. I talked to her manager about it, said, hey, we're going to do this. She's got two sons that work with us as well, so I called their managers and said, hey, here's what we're doing at, uh, before, the, before business hours, before it opens up. We're going to gather in there. Uh, let these boys come and pray with their mama. That's all I asked for. I uh, said, we'll, we'll get them back out to the job site, whatever. I just want them there with their mother during this time. And uh, I'm going to tell you something. We, we got in there that morning. When I walked in that call center, that thing was packed. And it wasn't just the boys. It was the crew chiefs. It was the other guys on the crew. It was the managers. There was other people in the, that I knew who were believers because we believe in the power of prayer, amen? And we gathered around there and got, some of us got on our knees and prayed with that lady. 
And one manager told me later, she said that she was very moved by this, one of the most wonderful things she'd ever witnessed in her life. That right there is what God can do if you just lead and just go where he, where he just follow him wherever it is. Again, this is just a glimpse. I could go on and on about missions near and away where God has shown up and shown out again and again. And again, this has nothing to do with me. I'm just a simple country boy from Dotsonville. My pulpit commentary states, oftentimes the surprise of life is the place in which God puts men and the work he gives them to do. Men always err when they force themselves to do what they think they would like to do. We are only safe. We are only on safe lines when we do what God gives us to do. He knows us. He knows all places, all work, all circumstances, so he can fit things and people together and make both work together for good. Again, the only thing that I know that is special about me is that I'm a child of God, but that's certainly enough. He tells me I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, and he tells me he has a plan for my life. And all I have to do when he calls on me is listen. And he will hold me with his strong right hand and lead me to do whatever it is he wants me to do. And he does or can do the same with you. Brothers and sisters, God is with us. We just need to call upon him, listen, and be faithful. Brother Lauren, as Brother Lauren comes up, I'll invite you this morning. If there's anybody here who is struggling with where the Lord may lead you, Is there anybody here that has circumstances going on in their lives with their family members and wonder, what, what's the word I need to say? What's the word I need to give them? Just bring it to the altar and ask. If there's those of you who just wonder, where is the Lord leading me? As we've just read, there's no mistake, he's with you. He's right there. Even if you don't see him, just turn around. He's right there. You can't get away from him if you try. If there's anybody there who thinks, I've gone, I've gone too far, I've done too much, there's no way he wants me. As we just read, that, there's no way that's true. And there's plenty of examples in the Bible where God has taken the worst of the men in those times and turned them around to use them for his honor and his glory. And he can do the exact same thing with you. Please bow your heads with me and pray. Dear Father God, we love you, Lord. Once again, we thank you for your many blessings, your love, your watch care. Lord, we thank you for your, for your guidance, how you lead us. Lord, I'd hate to think of where we would be if we were in this world alone. Lord, I pray blessings upon all these people that are here, those who are at home who can't join us, them and their families. Lord, lead God, direct them the only way that you can. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
There's joy for the morning. The sinner be still. Earth has no sorrow. Heaven can heal. Earth has no sorrow. Heaven can heal. So lay down your burdens. Lay down your All right, church, another great Sunday. I'm uh, glad y'all were here to join us. Logan, come on up, bring your family with you. So we're going to bring Logan up here. You know how we do when we get done, just form a circle around here and shake his hand, congratulate him, show him how we do, show him how we love him. Uh, don't forget to Sunday school, and with that, once you make your way through the line, you're dismissed. God bless. I love you guys. <laughs>